Good morning, everyone, and you're all very welcome to this morning's signpost webinar series, which is brought to you in association with Dairy Sustainability Ireland, National Rural Network and Food Drink Ireland Skillnet. Uh, Noel Meehan is my name, and I'm standing in for the usual hosts, Pat and Mark, this morning. Uh, this morning, we have Anne Goggin and Philip Murphy from the EU Waters of Life Project. Uh, they're joining us to tell us more about, about the project uh, and the role of agriculture measures and results-based payment schemes in delivering for water quality. And our colleague in Chagas, Maeve O'Hagan, uh, Climate Advisor in the Louth, Me Dublin Regional Unit, uh, will be helping with questions later. Good morning, uh, Anne, Philip and Maeve. Morning, Noel. Morning, Noel. How are you? We're all good now. Um, so I suppose Anne and Philip, you're you're going to talk to us today about the EU Wars of Life uh, project that you're both working in. But before that, maybe Anne, you could tell us a little bit about your background. I know you're you're you belong um, career behind you in 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 water quality. Thanks, Noel. Yeah, I've been working in water quality since the early noughties, um, a long time with Limerick City and County Council. When I started, we would have been working under the phosphorus regulations, which came in in 1998. Um, and in some ways, uh, it was a great piece of legislation and really guided us as to how to approach river protection. Um, later, that was overtaken by the Water Framework Directive, which took a broader approach to water quality and a slightly more risk based approach. Um, also involved in implementing the good agricultural practice regulations. So, yeah, been involved for a long time, but it's nice now to be a lot of that time was with the council on the inspection side now it's nice to be on the other side where you can actually offer farmers something <laughs> yes uh, I, i'm sure it is much nicer to be on this side of the fence uh, and philip you were um a farmer you formerly of chagask you've, you've done your phd i think through chagask yeah um i was based down in johnstone castle as a student in the acp program um i had a phd on nutrient balances at paddock scale across dairy farms in the country across the south, southeast of the country. Um, I jumped over then to the local authority waters program to gain experience in catchment science. And now I'm here as an agricultural science at the Waters, waters Life program. Very good. So you've seen both sides of the, of the coin, just as to speak. Yeah, exactly. Um, so look, without further ado, we'll get into the, the present presentations. And I think, Anne, you were going to start there this morning. Yeah, so thanks very much, your, Noel. If you can share your screen there and just I'd like to remind uh, our viewers to please direct your questions to the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. OK, so Anne, take it away. Great. Can you see my presentation there? Yeah, we can see it there, Anne, yeah. Great. OK, thanks very much. So the Waters of Life is an EU funded life integrated project. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with the LIFE programme. But for those of you who might not be, LIFE is the EU's funding instrument for the environment and climate action. It's been around for a long time, over 30 years. And in that time, it has financed numerous environmental projects to the tune of 6.5 billion euros. Integrated projects are a particular type of life project. These tend to be larger scale projects which run for longer time periods than traditional life projects. They're usually run by government departments um, with the aim of achieving the objectives of EU legislation or policy, in this case, the Water Framework Directive. And the ultimate aim of integrated projects is to influence policy in the relevant area and leverage funding for action in that area. So the focus of the Waters of Life is what are called high status objective or blue dot rivers. And these are rivers that are either at high status or should be at high status, but are not currently achieving that objective and have the objective of achieving it by 2027. High status equates to pristine or near pristine conditions and showing little or no impact from human activity. So these unspoiled rivers are very important for a number of reasons, not least of which is that they act as reservoirs of biodiversity and provide refuges for species that can be missing or extinct elsewhere in the catchments. So if water, proof, water quality improves elsewhere in the catchment, these areas can provide species for recolonization. 
Um, Ireland is one of the few European countries that still has a significant number of these healthy water bodies. However, we've been losing them at an alarming rate. And the chart here shows the change in the different status classes since the late 80s to 2022. Back in 2020. In, 20, in the late 1980s, we had 27% of our water bodies at high status, but that has declined now to 17%. So status is measured using a number of indicators, one of which is the Q value. Um, Q is a biological indicator, and it's a measure of the diversity and abundance of certain insect larga, larvae and other organisms in the riverbed. Some larvae, such as stonefly and mayfly nymphs, are very sensitive to pollution or habitat damage. Others, such as freshwater shrimp and leeches, are very resistant. So by looking at the communities living in the riverbed, scientists can say how healthy or otherwise the water body is. The Q value can range from Q5, which, as I've said, is pristine, to Q1, which is very seriously polluted and degraded. Q5 and Q4-5, which is slightly impacted, both equate to high status. I mentioned that we've been losing our high status water bodies, but we've been losing our Q5 or pristine sites at an even more alarming rate. Um, if you look at the chart here, it shows what's been happening, these Q5 sites since the late 80s. We've gone from having over 500 of them down to only about 40 at this stage. At the moment, we've got 334 uh, water bodies which have been set a high status objective under the third cycle of the River Basin Management Plan. Um, of these, these are mainly located along the West Coast and in County Cork. Cork has a particularly high concentration of these types of water bodies. They're usually associated with upland areas and poorly drained soils. But at the moment, less than half of these high status objective water bodies are achieving their high status. And some of them have declined to even poor status. So this brings us to the question of what activities are impacting on these rivers? High status water bodies, as I've said, tend to occur in more upland remote areas and as such, the profile of pressures acting on them tends to be a bit different from those acting on rivers in general. The main significant pressures acting on high status rivers are hydromorphology, agriculture and forestry, followed by peat, peat extraction, quarrying and domestic wastewater treatment plants. So hydromorphology, hydromorphology is a relatively new term that was coined under the Water Framework Directive. And to put it simply, it relates to the flow regime and the physical form of the river. So it essentially reflects the health of the river habitat. Um, Hi, the HIMO for short, um, the quality in that regard is measured by looking at departure from naturalness, which in turn depends on the type of the river and its landscape setting. HIMO pressures are a fairly broad church and they include things such as channelization, embankments, bank erosion, barriers, land drainage, overgrazing. And these in turn, many of these in turn relate back to other pressures such as forestry and agriculture. So that brings us to the, oops, sorry, I'm not sure what's happened there. <laughs> Sorry about that. So that brings us to the Waters of Life project. The aim of the project is to develop, test and validate measures for the protection and restoration of our high status objective rivers and to support the Blue Dot Catchments program, which is run by LawPro. We also aim to further our understanding of what has caused the decline in these uh, high status water bodies, which will help inform the actions under the project. The project will run until March 2028, and it has a budget of 20.2 million, of which 9.5 million has been committed by the EU. Uh, the project partners are the Department of Housing, Local Government and Heritage, which is the lead partner, Law Pro the Department of Agriculture, EPA, Chagas, Quilcha, the Forest Service, the OPW, and a number of leader companies. The project will operate in a number of demonstration catchments, five active demonstration catchments, and a sixth, which will act as a control. And these catchments were chosen to reflect the range of pressures already mentioned. 
all of the catchments have a range of pressures acting on them and measures to address all of the pressures will be explored through the project. However, three of the catchments were chosen to primarily explore agricultural pressures and two were chosen for forestry pressures. The control catchment was chosen because it is long term at high status and is not considered to be at risk. So this map shows the locations of our demonstration catchments. This one here is the islands catchment in uh, on the Galway Roscommon border. Uh, it's called the islands because that's the local name for the catchment, but it's actually based on the suck um, sub catchment 20 as defined under the water framework directive. Um, this is a uh, big beef farming area with quite a lot of peaty soils and the main pressure on the rivers in this area would be hydromorphology. The next is the Shornock down in County Cork and this is quite unusual in the context of high status um, because this area has very free draining soils and has quite a lot of dairy farming. Another very unusual aspect of this catchment is that both nitrate and phosphate are elevated in the river. And this is unusual because usually high nitrate levels are associated with, with free draining soils and high phosphorus levels are associated with poorly draining soils. But because of the nature of the bedrock in this area, which is iron rich old red sandstone, phosphorus doesn't bind well with the soil. So it tends to leach into the groundwater and to enter the river through a subsurface pathway, which as I've said, is quite unusual for phosphorus. The ter third catchment is also in uh, County Cork. This is the Aubeg. Um, this is a bit different to the Shornock in that the soils are very mixed and the types of farming are very mixed with a high proportion of tillage, uh, along with beef and dairy and other pressures operating in this catchment include wastewater, quarrying and industry. The forestry catchments are the Avonmore over here in County Wicklow and the Grainy here in County Clare. And these were chosen in consultation with the Forest Service and Quilcha on the basis that there would be significant forestry activity occurring in these catchments during the life of the project, which would give us the opportunity to explore mitigation measures there. In particular, what we're interested in is legacy forestry. So these are forestry stands which were planted prior to the current forestry guidelines and without the relevant setbacks and with maybe fairly dense drainage networks. So we're particularly interested in looking at how those forests can be managed in a way that doesn't impact on water quality. Um, some of the key project actions are uh, the characterization of the demonstration catchments. So this involves carrying out desk studies to understand the physical characteristics of the area, the land use and the likely pressures on water quality, followed by field work to pin down the specific issues. This work has been done for the project by law post catchment scientists. The desk studies are completed and they're all published on the project website. The field work has also been completed and the final reports are currently being prepared by law pro and they're due to be finished at, uh, in early 2024. Those will also be published on the project website. The second uh, action is the development of a framework of measures and best practice guidance for the protection of restoration of high status objective water bodies. I'm not going to say any more about this now because Philip will be speaking about that in a few minutes. A third and critical element of the project is the development of a results based payment scheme for both farmers and foresters. And to this end, four facilitated workshops were held over the summer with representatives from existing EIPs, the Department of Agriculture, Chagas, the EPA and a range of other specialists and state agencies. The workshops looked at the learnings from the existing results based schemes and how to adapt these to focus more specifically on water quality. The final report from these workshops is also available on the project website. Um, Based on the outcome of the workshops, the results-based scheme will be a hybrid scheme similar to the other EIPs where payment is not just for scores, but there's also a payment for non-productive investments and landscape measures which help improve a landowner scores. As I said, it will deal with both forestry and farming. And it's likely to focus on the riparian margins, so the areas immediately adjacent to the river channel, nutrient use efficiency and nutrient management, and also drainage management. Um, 
About 9.5 million has been ring fenced for the resource based scheme. It will run for three years from the beginning of 2025 to the end of 2027. And if successful, it will be incorporated into the next CAP ACM, or at least that would be the aim. Um, the Sorry, the project team are currently working on the development of the appropriate scorecards. Uh, and once options for these have been drafted, workshops will be held with farmers and forestries, foresters from the demonstration catchments, along with their representative bodies, to co-design the final details of the scheme, including the final payment structure. Um, the aim will be, as I said, to roll it out from 25 to 28. Um, it will be very targeted and the numbers accepted into the scheme will be quite low, probably only about 300 farms across all the catchments. And that's partly to ensure that payments can be pitched at a level that will be attractive to farmers who don't normally engage with agri-environmental schemes. But all of this, in the payment structure, the number of farmers involved will be part of the discussions with the landowners during the workshops next year. Um, an essential part of a project like this is to have a robust monitoring scheme in place to assess the effectiveness of measures. And this will be developed and implemented through an EPA funded research project called Restore. The Restore project will be delivered by a consortium consisting of Inland Fisheries Ireland and UCD and will be led by Dr. Fiona Kelly of the IFI and Dr. Mary Qu Kelly Quinn of UCD. Another important element will be achieving community buy-in and generating a sense of custodianship towards our aquatic resources. So as part of its contribution to the project, Chagask is funding a Walsh Fellowship to carry out a research project we'll look at, which will look at how to achieve attitudinal and behavioural change in this regard. Um, I suppose an important point to note is that this scheme will be entirely voluntary and for landowners and the project will have no role in enforcement or cross-reporting. Um, while the focus of this project will be on high status, many of the measures will be equally applicable across all river water bodies and should therefore help to address compliance with the Water Framework Directive more generally. So that's my presentation. Thank you very much for listening and I'll hand you over to Philip. Thanks. Uh, and so Philip, um, if you want to share your screen there. Um, is that set up correctly there for you? Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you. Okay, um, I'll jump right into it. So I'm just going to describe or give an overview on that framework document that Anne mentioned on the best practice measures for high status objective water bodies. And I'll dive into the Annex 1 for agriculture, um, which are measures specific to that pressure. Um, a lot of the context have been has been given there, but we're all, all this work stems from the, the River Basin Management Plan for Ireland. Um, that's largely implemented by the local authority waters program through their catchment scientists and community officers and that and that process of uh, engagement and, and and evidence gathering is carried out through them. Additionally, the blue dot program and the waters of life program is, is aiming to reverse that decline that Anne spoke about there in our high status or pristine river uh, water bodies at uh, the methods and Mr. Um, Dune. Sorry, sorry, Philip, uh, I'm just getting uh, in the chat that some people can't see the screen. Are you sure you're sharing that correctly? Um, I can. Maybe, maybe we share it there again. Yep. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it seems to be okay. Yeah. Somebody, people can see it now. Okay. Thanks. Sorry for interrupting you, Philip there. Okay. Thank you. Everything's okay there. Yeah, I think so, yeah. So both these programs aim to um, restore or improve or protect our high status objective water bodies. Uh, Blue Dot is doing, doing it through raising awareness and attention and resources towards implementing measures. And the Waters of Life is aiming to test, develop and validate these measures. As Anne said, through a results-based payment scheme and ultimately, ultimately to build up a technical understanding of how to design and implement the measures. This works alongside the Water EIP, which was recently launched as well in a similar format. And just, I suppose, as overall, you can see there's a real national effort really ongoing at the moment to improve water quality locally and nationally. So within the Waters of Life then, one of our main technical outputs to date is this framework document. 
um, and the annexes which are contained within it. Each of these annexes contains a menu or suite of measures that can be drawn from to deal with mitigating impacts from these pressures. Um, so that's from agriculture, forestry, peat extraction, quarries, and domestic wastewater treatment uh, systems. So the framework document itself then um, contains a lot of fundamental science on um, high status rivers, what that means. So the Q values explained there, the um, the invertebrate biota that, that indices that are used to, de to decide on what the water body will achieve in terms of status, the importance of re report, uh, reporting back to the WFD on this and what the expectations are to meet the regulations. Um, the water body conditions explained in it, so that's all the nutrients issue, or sorry, the issues that can affect the water body um, from nutrients to sediment, um, pesticides, hydromorphology, um, each in detail and, um, you know, the, the real, the pressures that are associated with them and how they can come about in a water body and what it means for the invertebrate. Similarly, then in, in the kind of a desk, desk study approach, the landscape setting and the importance of that, topography, uh, groundwater vulnerability, soil type, aquifer type, all these factors are essential for essentially picking the right measure to address the issue in the water body. The catchment pressures there range from and, and, and dealt with this, hydromorphology, agriculture, forestry, and wastewater treatment plants. Um, and then there's information on how to choose whether the measure needed is for restoration or protection, for protection and what that objective means. If somebody was coming in cold to this process, the catchment science process, the measure selection principles um, kind of protocol is there as well to give people an idea on what's, what's expected of trying to choose the right measure in the right place. There's a section. There's a section on environmental coal benefits. Benefits. So the the picture greater than you know bigger picture than water quality itself. The wider ecosystem, biodiversity and greenhouse gas emissions and air quality as well. And there's information on the monitoring program um, on what's expected from a monitoring program and and its value to um if, you know that feedback loop to improving uh, implementation design and um, the technical information that's required. There's information on citizen science uh, in that monitoring section too. So the Annex 1 for agriculture then, in the first few sections, it, it talks about the national, um, I suppose, effort or targets, uh, targeting that's required for agricultural measures at the moment. Um, the difference between where restore measures and protect measures are needed across the country. So about 38% of the land area is needed for restore farming measures at the moment. And they're all indicated by the, the orange flags there. Um, there's an updated version available on the web, EPA website at the moment. And then there's about 62% of the area that remains for protect measures. So we do need to protect what is achieving its um, objective at the moment, be it good or high uh, nationally. Um, and we need to make sure we're doing the right thing for measure in, in our measures for that. There's a flow chart on how to evaluate the measure's effectiveness or its usefulness, at least the protocol there for it, a guideline. Um, again, just to gather the technical information that's needed to do it right. And then there's the measure's effectiveness tables, which I'll explain more in detail. Um, the I just need to explain a bit about the pollutant transfer process, which is how a pollutant gets to our waterway. Um, this is important because this is how the uh, measures in the Ag document, the Annex 1, are um, listed. So our receptor is always going to be, say, the lowest point in our catchment, the, the river or lake or an estuary or a tributary. And that's the recipient of everything that will, all the activities that occur on, on a catchment. Our sources then can be nutrients, sediments, um, say pesticides. Just in the case of nutrients, it can be the organic manure collected during the winter storage period, the dung and urine during the grazing period, during the summers, and then our chemical fertilizers that we add on as well. So that led to our total nutrient load <clears throat> or the source load. Similarly, a sediment, sediment area from bare soils and tillage areas or a poached area like this, um, the amount of area and its connectivity to the waterways all um, a factor in this process and then pesticides and their, their timing and use. So to get from that source to receptor level, there needs to be uh, something that bridges it, and that's our weather system and our rainfall. So as we go from source to mobilization there, we need to consider that, say, just for example, in agriculture, the timing of our applications, plus the weather that goes with it, um, that connects us to our pathways. Our pathways will be typically surface or subsurface, which is overland flow on poorly drained soils or subsurface through uh, groundwater and into our receptor then again. 
So what I'm trying to show here is that there's at least three opportunities to intervene in the pollutant transfer transfer process uh, with mitigation measures before it reaches our receptor. And we have options at the receptor level as well to deal with these. So in our Annex 1, there's 44 measures altogether, as I said, divided there across source control, source reduction, uh, mobilization control, pathway interception, and in-stream works. These range from, um, you know, they're not all novel or experimental. They're kind of straightforward. Some of them fall underneath our gap regulations and conditionality. Some of them, you know, we, we haven't tested yet. They're borrowed from other projects that have achieved water quality improvements in the past before. So as a full list, you can just see that there's a lot of options there for people to, to dive into, be it advisors or any practitioners working on this on the ground. And the information that's available, we tried to structure this as, as concisely as possible to give people the best information in a short time span as they try to make a decision on what measure would be most useful for the scenario they're dealing with. So the first paragraph will deal with the context and aim. We just have some notes on implementation ideas. We explain costs where they're available. Uh, obviously, this is quite variable. And then things to consider either on the farm, uh, pre or post the farm visit, um, maybe who to contact, uh, who to ask for licenses and contractors and that type of thing, notes like that, that'll help decide, help inform your decision. Uh, the other notes then may include information on other ecosystem benefits like biodiversity or uh, greenhouse, greenhouse gas um, reductions. The source of information there, it's not so much a reference table, but it's a link to um, follow on with more information if needed on a particular topic. So you can make your own decision on whether this measure is useful. So each, each measure uh, in our annexes have a score assigned to them. And this really does add a huge amount of value to the decision that needs to be made for picking the right measure in the right place. So the effectiveness potential score uh, was based on the, the research and literature that was available at the time. Um, there may not have been an exact score value for each measure, but the, the research would have indicated what would be the most useful or most likely score to be, to, be, to be used. Some projects did have actual scores themselves. The Smarter Buffers project, for example, um, had actual scores for some of the um, pathway interception measures. Um, the scores then were reviewed by various experts and provided feedback, and, and that was developed as it came in. Um, I suppose the assumption you need to make with using these measures is that they're evaluated in isolation. So maybe the score is, um, so the score ranges from high, medium, and low, and then insignificant. So it may surprise you that it might be at low, but that's if you use the measure in isolation. So the idea then is that each of these measures could be stacked, and that will improve the overall effectiveness of the actions that are being put in. The color codes then um, refer to whether it's a mandatory measure in the gap regulations or not, and then what, what section of the pollutant pathway it sits on. So looking at phosphate, uh, this table is available in the annex as well. So this is the table is organizing the measures by the issue and then by the landscape setting. So looking down there on the left, you can see the uh, poorly drained sites are first and the effectiveness rating is ordered from high, medium down to low. So the highest, me highest measures for phosphate would relate to farmyard management, complying with land spreading and spatially targeted buffer. And then on the free draining setting on the right here, um, the the highest setting that can be uh, or rating, sorry, that can be achieved is low uh, regards uh, invasive species. Oh, sorry, invasive species relates to the poorly drained, um, the farmyard management here as well. Similarly for nitrate, um, listed in order of uh, high to um, to low again at the poorly drained setting. There's very few uh, measures available and um, less, available, less less measures available again for nitrogen with the only high one showing, say, a, redu a reduction in end loading. So again, this is where the importance of stacking the measures would come in as well. Sediments, similar process, poorly drained sites, poorly drained, uh, freely drained sites, and, and their effectiveness from high to low. Also in, in the annex is um, the full list of measures where you can pick out individual <clears throat> um, issues and then the, the landscape setting again to identify what's the most um, useful approach. I'm going to try and use the Excel version here just for a second. <clears throat> okay, um, provided that's showing now, um, the Excel version just makes it a little bit quicker. So if we've got sediment as our significant issue in the water body, and uh, we want to look at what the options for us in a poorly drained setting 
we can filter that by, we look at our most effective measures first, and we have them listed here, both whether they're under, uh, under gap compliance or not, and what section of the uh, pollutant pathway process they are part of as well. Um, so that gives us an idea and a quick way of discovering which measures be more suitable for the situation we're looking at. Okay, um, provided everything is back there. Um, so ultimately, there, our goal here is to um, identify what part of the um, transfer pathway there do we need to address, uh, what measures are available. So here for, um, we can have two measures there on our source reduction efforts, um, give us the best chance of reducing that total source load, add in two more actions for the mobilization section, um, reduce our 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 chances of the um, whatever it could the pollutant be in this case could be nitrate reaching a pathway that will lead to the groundwater receptor, and if we want to be very good, we can try and get another interception pathway measure in there as well. So we're reducing or minimizing the chance of any pollutant reaching that receptor level. So that's it for the the Annex One on agriculture. It's um, we're considering it a live document, so it'll be kind of updated semi semi regularly. I've had feedback on what measures could be added, um, such as sheep dip and some of the best practices around that has been one this suggestion. Uh, I do hope to update as well as say diagrams or pictures or some kind of um, illustrations like that. But the feedback and that will depend on who's using this and and delivering the feedback back to us on actually improving those uh, effectiveness scores that we have. We could consider those effectiveness scores as a, a first draft in a way. And depending on the feedback and information that comes back from advisors and practitioners using these measures, we expect to improve and validate and develop the measures that we're, we've displayed here. So the documents are available now on our website on watersalife.ie and under the resources tab, uh, you can get them all. They're all separated there as individual uh, links to download and use uh, immediately with those tables that are available. The Excel version is there uh, for people to use as well, which is a very handy way to do it. Uh, so I just want to acknowledge everyone that was involved in the development of that publication, that technical document from the RPS group um, and any consul consul uh, consultants and stakeholders that are involved in the assessment of the scores. I want to thank all the catchment scientists that were involved in both the fieldwork side of it and the desk studies that were used for the for our demonstration catchments. And I want to acknowledge Donald Daly as a catchment scientist who gave a lot of feedback on our work here. Uh, that's all for me. So if you do have information about the, the booklets themselves, get in touch and um, we can do our best to add, it, add to the list for, for uh, using it. Thanks for your time. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> thanks very much, Philip, and thanks, Anne. So you can turn your your screens, uh, cameras back on, and uh, your uh, un unmute your microphone. So, uh, just a reminder to uh, listeners to uh, put your questions into the uh, Q and A tab at the bottom of your screen. Um, so, thanks. That was very interesting. Both presentations. Um, I suppose maybe we start with a. Uh, a question there around um, you spoke you're working on a live project and I know there's we've had people on here about EIPs and I suppose sometimes people maybe get confused what's the difference between a life and a life IP and, and, a, and an EIP um, um, maybe you could enlighten us then please if you yeah, uh, the fundamental difference is really where the funding comes from. Um, EIPs, European Innovation Partnerships, are funded under the Rural Development Programme and the Common Agricultural Policy, while LIFE projects are funded uh, by a separate funding stream dedicated to this LIFE area, to environment and biodiversity and climate change. Um, and LIFE integrated projects are just a particular type of large scale LIFE project. So again, funded under this LIFE program. So that's the fundamental difference. It's where the, the funding comes from. Okay, thanks, Sam, for, for clearing that up for us there. Um, I suppose just looking at the, uh, the, there's a question in there about this morning's presentation will be available and just to, to clarify that all the webinars that um, the signpost webinars are available. If you went to the Chagas main page and in the search function, look for signpost webinars, you'll, you'll find the webinars there for uh, going back uh, to all the, all the webinars that we've done. Um, so I suppose the, maybe maybe Anne again for you, a, a question that was in um, around the Q5 
and, and the loss that we have and, and the, the queries around whether it is a reflection of um, a change in how they were assessed from 25, 30, 40 years ago, uh, or is it an increase in the actual pressure or maybe a bit of both? Um, the, the the metric that was used to describe the change was the Q value, and that has been very consistently applied in Ireland since the 70s when monitoring first began. In fact, the same people were doing the monitoring, the same two individuals in the EPA and its um, forerunners were involved up until the mid noughties So we have really consistent, good quality data running through that period. Very good, very good. And I suppose, um, the, could you maybe elaborate? Maybe this is we have um, picked you picked catchments with different pressures uh, on them, you know, and you deliberately did that. So you have forestry pressures, and you have free draining catchment with 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 uh, nitrogen pressures, and you have phosphorus and, and hydro hydromorphology pressures there. Um, but we have a specific question in: Could we add? maybe elaborate on how forestry is impacting because you know um the question is around trees helping uh to uh prevent uh or helping water quality in certain circumstances but i suppose the forestry is a little bit different as to how they that is impacting water quality in these high status areas so which would you like if we just would you like to take that well Noel? i don't mind <laughs> for, for um go ahead then uh, yeah, so I suppose forestry impacts in a number of ways. Um, primarily, it impacts during forestry activities. So during planting and during harvesting. Um, during planting and harvesting, you can get soil disruption and you can get sedimentation. It also impacts when there's drainage works done to facilitate the, the uh, forestry. Um, if there's any fertilization, that can impact as well. But when a forestry uh, stand is mature and just there, the impacts are much less than when it's actually been clear felled or planted. Um, in some cases, it can lead to acidification, but the primary impacts would be sedimentation and nutrient loss during forestry operations. Okay, thanks, Anne. So maybe Maeve, do you want to ask yeah, a few questions um there? I have one here now. I think, um, Philip, your experience in catchment science um, will lend this one well to you. Um, there's just a question there in terms of actually identifying where the source pressure is coming from. So if there is maybe multiple sources in, in a catchment, um, whether that be urban wastewater or, or agriculture and high mow or whatever it might be, how do you actually identify where the source load is coming from and to def be able to differentiate between the sources? Thanks, Maeve. Um, so like I said, the, the river is the final recipient of all the activities on uh, uh, on it, so be it those pollutants. The job of the catchment scientists, um, and in our case, the law pro scientists, is to disaggregate or untangle where and which pressures that comes from. The way they do that is through a desktop study, which does a lot of characterization on, say, the, the distribution of pressures across the catchment peat agriculture, forestry or wastewater treatment plants, and then identifies what I showed there, the pollutant transfer pathway. Um, does Do those pressures uh, actually reach the receptor at the end as well? So they have their desk, desk study uh, carried out, gives you a good idea of the, the story of the catchment. And then a lot of field work is carried out through, say, the winter and summer season to gather evidence of impact. Um, there's a lot of work on into taking chemistry samples, identifying pathways and uh, looking at the ecological status and say the invertebrates through kick samples to narrow down whether the pressure is reaching the rece receptor or not and wh what that issue is. Um, ultimately, what it leads to is say you've a 30 kilometer stretch of water body getting narrowed down to say a couple of tributaries, which could be 15, 10 or 15 kilometers long instead. So you get a real targeted approach and you get that disaggregation between the pressures um, in a catchment. Yeah, it, it is literally untangling a web, like to try and try and narrow it down. Yeah, but you have yeah. it down to a fine art and fairness. And in fairness, Maeve, um, a lot of work requires speaking with um, practitioners on the ground, like advisors like yourselves, um, and, you know, if I uh, EPA the information that's available in PWS, all those um, conversations are very important in, um, I suppose, uh, finding out what the distribution of pressures as well. So it's not a, 
the catchment the catchment approach requires everyone that's involved in the catchment to, to have a contribution yeah absolutely and there's just one there as well and i am I think you had a slide up there that showed the the um decline in the numbers of the high status water bodies that we have in Ireland over the years. And there's just a question there in in terms of how those numbers have changed over the years and and what the outlook is in terms of being able to achieve those um good status and high status objectives that we have, you know, what the outlook is on being able to achieve them. Um, well, I think we have the science. We understand pretty well what's driving the decline and what we need to do to reverse that. I suppose um, getting those changes in practice is the challenge. And to a certain extent, like landowners are the solution and working with landowners and incentivizing them and making sure that doing the measures that are needed for environmental protection, be it water quality, biodiversity, climate change, that there's financial incentives there for them to take those measures. I think that's going to be a very important element going forward, developing this idea of an ecosystem services model where landowners are rewarded for the ecosystem services that their lands can provide. Very good. Um, another one just there for you. Um, obviously, you're, you're, it's, in, it's innovative in that you're looking at a, a results-based payment scheme for water quality. And, and while those are have been in place, um, are currently in place in acres and and uh, a, a, um, AETS around biodiversity. It's um, it'd be interesting to see how you gauge and how you mark um, a results based payment for water quality. And maybe um, could you elaborate a little bit more on how you might see that ha uh, happening? Um, yeah. Uh... I suppose we know what the major issues are in high status subjective water bodies, and they tend to be nutrients and hydromorphology, in particular sediment or physical alterations to the water body. And from the workshops, um, it became clear that those are the areas that need to be our focus. Uh, I suppose what's a bit different about this is we're working in uh, the types of catchments that aren't really that normally associated with high status objective. And that's because we chose to work outside of the cooperation areas uh, so that there wouldn't be confusion and overlap between two results-based schemes that were looking at water quality. So while previous schemes like the Pearl Mussel and the Wild Atlantic Nature looked at water quality, they used terrestrial biodiversity um, and whole farm scores as a proxy for water quality. Whereas in our case, that's not necessarily going to be the case. In a lot of our catchments, we've got improved grassland and some of these terrestrial indicators won't be immediately applicable. So that really was a challenge. But when you kind of boil it down, uh, what we need to be looking at is nutrient management and nutrient use efficiency and making sure that nutrients aren't leaching into the waterways. Um, Sediment, so looking at drainage management and making sure it's not creating a sediment source or a pathway for nutrients as well. And then looking at the health of these riparian margins. Um, and this is more than just looking at them as buffer zones. A buffer zone is really useful for as a pathway interception measure for pollutants. But riparian margins can perform a range of other functions as well that are really important to rivers um, and can interact with rivers as part of the river ecosystem. So everything from providing woody debris into the river or leaf litter for um, macroinvertebrates. Um, so we're looking at that, kind of looking at how we can... Um, I suppose, optimize the use of those riparian zones, optimize nutrient use and optimize drainage management. But we also have to have an eye to the wider issues, um, to the biodiversity issues and the climate issues. But our mm -hmm. primary focus will be on these specific water quality related issues. OK, that's very interesting. And I suppose maybe, maybe this is an unfair question, but how that's kind of in a grassland setting. Is it possible to, uh, you know, obviously your forestry settings as well there? Um, have you any thought or I know and I know you have to work on your um, measures like you have in agriculture as well, Philip. But is there any kind of thought into in how uh, the results base might work in forestry or is that um, on the cards? And 
<laughs> yeah, um, again, the riparian zones, and this again came across from the workshops looking at the forestry pressures, those riparian zones and riparian margins are critical. So making sure that they are in place, that they are performing the functions that they were intended to perform, that there's no drainage crossing them. So we'll be very much looking at that type of thing. And utilising the schemes that are available. Um, yes. You know, the woodland schemes that are available through the Forest Service and that as well. Um, you know, we're not exclusive in any way. If we can, I suppose, um, partnership with existing schemes that are there, it'll work. Our farmers have ideas or options available to them. We'll be able to support mm. existing schemes rather than uh, step on anyone's toes. And, and I suppose maybe continuing on that theme, uh, and this is this is probably one I think I know the answer to, but uh, when we're in relation to hydromorphology, one of the questions that's come in is is obviously there's a lot of channelization and, and degradation and straightening and that kind of thing. Um, is is there anything within the the wars of life for for restoring those or, or re meandering or you know uh, there's I know there's different pilot projects around the country looking at that but I, I, I'm not so sure it stretches that stretches to your remit in the wars of life or did it that. Well, it's something we're exploring. Um, so at the moment, CBEC have been engaged to do a hydromorphological assessment of the island's catchment and develop a river restoration plan. Um, and the reason we chose the islands is looking at the morphological quality index, which is a desk based index of hydromorphological quality. It was the most degraded catchment in that regard. So we're waiting the uh, was the report from CBEC and hopefully that will point us towards measures that could be taken. Um, it's not, we're not saying they will be taken. It will be a matter of consulting with local landowners and because everything in this is voluntary, that it will be how acceptable these measures are to, to mm. landowners. Okay. I expect a kind of a large knowledge transfer campaign as well, Noel, in each of the catchments um, when we have our catchment management plans based on the fieldwork data to show what is needed, you know, to, to kind of show that distribution of what's a protect measure and a restore measure as well. Uh, that will involve a lot of engagement from the ground up, um, a bit like the law pro and ASAP approach. Mm -hmm. um, I imagine through advisors that are currently working on the ground and through community groups and community centres as well to get involvement and engagement that way. And, and, you know, once we can show what's happening with the evidence on the ground, we can have ideas at a local level then as well. Not, not so much a top down approach at all, um, but a bottom up. Yeah. And I, I think when you were going through your, your presentation there, Philip, and you were talking about the pollution transfer process mm -hmm. and you showed what it meant and, and the, and the, and the terminology around it. Um, and, you know, People who are working in the, in the in the area are familiar with those terms, but I suppose you know if you go out on 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 to catchments and start talk to farmers, you do need to to be able to explain that and you know help them understand. And and I'm, I'm sure you'd agree that that's an important part of what you will be doing going forward with the waters of life and those catchments. Hugely, Noel. Um, it's a it's one thing to have your desk study completed from behind the safety of your computer here and look yeah. at your maps and make a conclusion. Um, and even your field work, when you uh, collect your data at the water level, be it for nutrients or um, the pressures you may see when you're out there, that's all out of date as soon as you leave the, the catchment again. So you need to be down on the ground meeting people and being involved with farmers or people in the community um, and, and that as well to, to get the full understanding of what's going on in the catchment. And that's a, that's a knowledge exchange of anything there um, to get the best picture and have, have people on board with this. You know, we're not trying to... Uh, invade any any catchments here and like that the ultimate goal is to improve water quality at a local level um you know we use our technical names for the rivers here a lot of the time but there's local names for the rivers that uh, we like to use as well we're down on the ground and that gives people a, a sense of connection to it and shows the importance of it and there will be a dedicated uh, person advisor person to for these catchments as well yeah yeah there will be one catchment officer based in each of the catchments um, as the kind of the, the main contact person in that area. And they'll work with local landowners and local advisors and community groups. But we'll also be working with Law Pro in the areas and the Law Pro community water officers will be um, involved as well. Yeah. And uh, and some of them actually overlap, overlap with, with PAs at ASAP are working in as well. So there'll be a yeah. link in there as well. So yeah. 
Yeah, Maeve, sorry. Yeah, no, I'm just yeah. looking. There's just a couple of questions here um, that are mentioning the, the acres scheme and kind of a bit of overlap maybe with some of the measures um, that are involved, some of the water protection measures that will be involved or included in the acres scheme there. So if there's a farmer who's um, maybe in, in a, a co-op area for, for the acres, um, is, is that going to have an impact then on whether they can participate in the waters of life? There's a question there, but if there's an overlap with the, the grainy catchment um, with the acres co-op zone. And, uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, Anya. I suppose, yeah, a fundamental principle is to avoid double payments. So that will have to be the kind of baseline. But there's no reason why a farmer couldn't receive a top-up payment to the project, provided there wasn't... Um, there wasn't a double payment issue. Now, the Grainy and the Avonmore do have cooperation areas. The other three, the agricultural catchments, um, are outside of the cooperation areas. But we will be doing some work on um, farms within the Grainy and the Avonmore as well. But that will be one of the important issues is to avoid double payments and just top up where possible. Yeah, but I suppose if, if there was a farmer that was participating in the scheme that hadn't maybe selected specific measures that you think would be recommended in that area there's no reason then why they couldn't like you said get the top up payment if they were to implement extended buffer zones or whatever it might be repairing yeah. areas okay, yeah per yeah perfect as far as i understand it Anne, as well that the workshops that are coming up we'll have farmers involved in at some stage in the process say of the scorecards and some of the the ward system that we'll be using as well um Think to to include that bottom up approach as well, which I think is very important for um, an integrated project like this one. Yeah, and 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 I suppose just following on from the acres, I suppose when when farmers were applying for the acre scheme, it was t uh, tiered in terms of um, uh, preference in entering. Is there going to be a similar um, system there for for your own program? Yeah, we'll have to be very targeted and very selective because our funding is so limited and it really it has to be worth the landowners while getting involved. So there will be a, a kind of a tiered system. We'll be looking primarily maybe at river at landowners who have significant river frontage or streams running through their lands or farmers who may not have um, that, but who have drainage entering the river and might be impacting the river. So we will be targeting um, those types of farmers. But I should say as well that part of our objective is protect. It's not all about restore. So where we find examples of, say, really good uh, riparian zones or really good management practices that are benefiting water quality, we'll be rewarding those as well. That's, that's great. I think a lot of farmers will be happy to happy to hear that as well. You know, it's great to see them being rewarded for, for the good work that is being done as well. Um, so there's just a question come in there, um, looking at, at, at farmers and landowners and, and you know, obviously um, it's water quality it has never been more uh, in, in, in the media than it is in the last uh, couple of months. And, you know, certainly around um, obviously 250, 220 and, and, and the reduction in stocking rate there. Um, and I suppose the question is, and maybe this is this is for 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 your for your your uh, nitrogen one there, the Shornock, where you have um, a similar, you know, a, a diffuse nitrogen is 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 the risk there. How are you? How can you bring farmers on board, um, bring them on site when they already feel, you know, that that maybe they're 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 already being un, unfairly targeted and unfairly blamed for water quality? It's, it's going to be a big challenge uh, in the likes of the Shornock for you. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, again, Noel, I think that's a, a big knowledge transfer effort there and engagement effort as well on the ground. You know, um, we'll offer the measures that are, are necessary for what we need at the water quality level, um, and uh, we need feed, we'd need feedback on that. You know, like a, like we are the pilot scheme for water quality, so it's the feedback on the design of these measures, the implementation of them, the attractiveness of them, um, and their effectiveness overall for actually improving water quality, that whole process will be, I suppose, disseminated to farmers on the ground and see, does it work for them? may not work for everyone, um, but there, I'm sure there will be farmers who see this as an opportunity for them um, to engage on that water quality side of it as well. So I imagine we'll be getting down on the ground, meeting some of these farmers uh, with the interest on it and try and get a, 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 you know, a team on board 
we're taking actions on it, uh, perhaps a catchment level rather than any individual farm level. Um, but I suppose I do trust the, the process here with the the um, data collection and advisory approach mm -hmm. and the, the farmer feedback too, to, to give us a steer on what's possible or not. I know it's particularly sensitive down the ground at the moment with farmers, with how quickly all these rules are changing around nutrient management and stocking rates and that type of thing. So there is frustration there. So we fully expect to, you know, to have engagement on that and discussions on that um, to see what would be more suitable. But that's just part of the design process at this stage, you know, um, what it does take to, to implement the measure. Yeah, and I suppose, and you you mentioned um there about you know how how this goes and and the potential for this then to feed into the next uh, cap and the next uh, agri environmental schemes in the cap, and I think you know that that's that's an important kind of a, a goal or an important um, result of 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 this of this program. Uh, yeah, absolutely, and it's one of the things we have to be mindful from the outset that what might work on a small scale project, and even though this has quite significant funding, it is still a relatively small scale project. How can that be scaled up to national level? Um, and so it can't be overcomplicated. We could design a Rolls Royce of a scheme that delivers wonderfully in our demonstration catchments. And then when it comes to the next round of cap, it might just be thrown out as too complicated. So we need to be mindful of that all the way through, that whatever we do has to be scalable up to national level. Yeah. Maybe even... you... Sorry, yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry, no, just to say that the Annex 1 measures that I just showed today, they're not specific, well, they're, they are specifically high status objective water bodies, but they can be used across... Uh, any water body, good status, objective, or or lower, so they're we're not uh, limiting it in any way either. And actually, just to, just while I have the microphone, the double on Maeve's point there about promoting um, the good activities on farms too, on on your social media streams and whatever you can as well, because I think it's very easy to promote negative things, and that stuff seems to get momentum. But as, if you've any chance at all promoting what what good you're doing across your farm or in a catchment area, get that up online as well, and and um, we can start to increase that that positive outlook on the agriculture side of things. Absolutely, I agree. I agree with you on that one. Um, Eve, have you any further questions? There? Yeah, well, look at I, I suppose it's a great project, and kind of circling back to your very first question, Noel, in terms of the difference between the EIP and the the Waters of Life pro program, and then I think I called it an EIP then again at that stage. So I'll remember now the difference between the the funding sources for the future. But look at yeah, it's just great to see another positive program going out on the ground. I think that that's going to get farmers engaged, and even to like that the the KT role that that's going to play in terms of educating and raising awareness on those local catchment issues is uh, is crucial. So, um, so no, it's, it's great to see it um, being rolled yeah. out. Like, I, I suppose you're, you're probably going to be striving to make this as farmer friendly from an application and terms and conditions point of view going forward. Absolutely. Um, we'll be looking at the terms and conditions from the EIPs that have gone before. Um, so projects like the Do Hallow Farming for Blue Dots, the, the Pearl Mussel Project. Yeah, so we'll, we, we won't be reinventing the wheel. We will be trying to build on what's gone before and what's worked well before for farmers and other landowners. Very good. Um, I think that that's that's very important. That you know, I, I'm involved with the Waters EIP myself at the minute, and and that that feedback is there. That these things have to be um, farmer friendly. I suppose is the best way of, of phrasing it. All aspects of it, and um, I suppose maybe um, the payment rates that you're hoping to provide to farmers are are, are they going to be um, in line with what's there in acres currently, or or have you any? I know that you're, it's dependent. On budget and all that as well but just maybe have you a feel for what way that might go um to an extent yes we realize the payments have to be significant to attract landowners in um but at the end of the day it will be a discussion with the landowners and one of the things that came across at the workshops uh was that when landowners were given a choice between higher payments or having more landowners involved, they generally went for having more landowners involved. So I think it's it's hard to preempt the outcome of those discussions. Okay. Well, I'm afraid, unfortunately, we're, we're out of time. Uh, so I'd like to um, thank Philip and Anne for coming on and telling us about your interesting project. And uh, I wish you well. 
and you've got a lot of work, good work done. Uh, but obviously, you, you've plenty more to do yet. Um, and to, and uh, I hope the farmers uh, that you're going to be contacting uh, buy into it and, and support you in that. And I'm no doubt they will. Uh, so listen, thanks very much uh, to Philip and to Anne. Um, and thanks to me for helping with the questions this morning as well. Um, next week, just to let you know, next Friday is uh, obviously right on, on Christmas, uh, right up, up to Christmas with Aina Nilauna, author, broadcaster and member of CRRU Task Force to talk about wildlife and Christmas traditions. So I think that'll be a very, very festive uh, um, show next week. So listen, thanks to everybody. Uh, have a great, uh, to everybody for joining us this morning. Have a great weekend. And I want to thank our production team of Pat Murphy and Yvonne Maher in the background and uh, wish you all well and uh, have a good weekend. Bye now. Thank thanks, you. Noel. Thanks, Maeve. Bye. Bye.